Thank you for joining us tonight for After Dark Online, Representation Through Visualization. My name is Kathleen McGuire, and I'm part of the team that puts on these weekly After Dark programs. While tonight's program has been recorded remotely, I would like to acknowledge that the home of After Dark, the Exploratorium at Pier 15 in San Francisco, is located on unceded territory, traditionally belonging to the Ramatush Ohlone people. We pay our respects to elders, both past and present, for their caretaking of this land. Throughout our programs in February, we'll be honoring Black History Month by sharing histories from Black communities and cutting edge work from Black scientists, historians, artists, and community leaders. Tonight's program considers representation in visual systems through two distinct lenses, graphic design, and technologies driven by machine learning. Later on, we'll be hearing from Deb Raji, who researches bias in machine learning driven systems with a particular focus on facial recognition technologies. In her talk, she'll be sharing some of this groundbreaking research, as well as advocating for the need for algorithmic justice and to adopt a guiding principle of, if it doesn't work for everyone, it doesn't work as these systems are deployed. Up first, a conversation with graphic designer and educator Silas Monroe about his recently developed class, Black Design in America, and his thoughts on the power of graphic design, as well as the many pieces that are missing from dominant design history. Silas Monroe engages in practices that, ins that inspire people to elevate themselves and improve society. His design studio, Polymode, has designed identities and publications for exhibitions of Jacob Lawrence at MoMA and Mark Bradford at the Venice Biennale. His writing has appeared in Slanted, The Walker Reader, and the book W.E.B. Du Bois' Data Portraits Visualizing Black America, which is a subject that comes up a little bit in this talk. He is particularly interested in the often unaddressed post-colonial relationship between design and marginalized communities. He is assistant professor at Otis College of Art and Design, as well as advisor and chair emeritus at Vermont College of Fine Arts. I'm excited that Silas is joined in this conversation by my Exploratorium colleague, Nina Fujikawa. Nina is lead graphic designer at the Exploratorium, and she currently focuses on marketing, branding, and exhibition design history. I'll pass this over to Nina and Silas. Hey Silas, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I wanted to start with a quick question about, um, about your history, and I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about uh, yourself and your journey to your career as a graphic designer and educator. Sure, it's really nice to meet you, Nina. I'm really excited to be here. Um, for me, I was always drawn to libraries growing up as a kid. So there was this little community library, the Woodrow Wilson Public Library that was um, part of my neighborhood in suburban Virginia. And I just was always drawn to how quiet it was and the books, like the smell of the books, the physicality totally. of them <laughs> always just really resonated for me. And, you know, as I uh, grew up and was interested in so many subjects, there's something about design and art that just kind of, kind of made everything make sense. And so now I'm a book designer uh, graphic designer, you know, write about design. And I just, there's something about that particular object that's this combination of text and image and even the physicality of it that I 
think it still is very soothing <laughs> for yeah. me like, to turn the pages of a book. So it's kind of where where I got connected to design. Yeah, I, I totally feel you. I feel like I have the a, a very similar uh, just longing and nostalgia for libraries and and bookstores and the smell of the glue and the ink and the paper. It, it definitely was like a, um, you know, a big turning point when I realized that that was something that I could make too. So pretty cool. Um, what, what was your initial experience of design history? Um, and when did you begin to see the, the missing pieces, the missing parts of the history? Um, my first experience with design history was, well, there's art history first, right? Um, I think um, I had an amazing high school art teacher named Mrs. Monroe, um, who was always bringing in examples of amazing artists. And um, she also had like really amazing calligraphy. So she would put quotes of artists like that she was you know, drawing basically, and like pin them up. And one of her parting gifts for me when I went to RISD uh, was a book by Edward Tufte oh, <laughs> called Visual nice. Visualizing Information. Yeah. She could kind <laughs> of tomb. tell it the tomb. Yeah, exactly. Tome <laughs> of tome of uh, of information design history. And um, but kind of that once I declared graphic design as a major, and I've always been someone who's been kind of like, wasn't sure, like, paint, am I a painter, am I a poet? Yeah. And Doug Scott has a class at RISD that he still teaches, which is kind of amazing because he's actually one of my students. Oh, in wow. In BIPOC design history class, he comes to every class. <laughs> um, but Doug Scott teaches this intro to graphic design history and he uh, is very captivating. He's an amazing lecturer. He's got this encyclopedic knowledge and um, he assigns every student a designer to research when you're mm -hmm. in this class. And Herbert Beyer of the Bauhaus was the designer that I was given. And I think, uh, I don't know, as an undergrad, I kind of even was like, well, like, where are the designers that look like me? You know? Yeah. Like, were designers of color, were queer designers. And, um, you know, I also had the good fortune of taking a design history class at CalArts when I was in grad school. That was a year long that Lorraine Wilde did. And it just like added more richness and dimension, but it still like didn't see myself. And I think as I began particularly to be a teacher myself mm -hmm. and had students who also were not reflected in Philip Meggs or in kind of uh, the discourse of design, I started like asking these questions and trying to do my own research into that. Yeah, yeah, I was um, actually in preparing for this, this uh, conversation of ours, I was flipping through my copy of Meg's and goodness, this is not an, a good example of decolonized history. <laughs> there is like, no, I was looking for, Du Bois and Douglas and just no mention of anyways it's pretty it was pretty stunning for you know to, for me personally to revisit um, a part of my education and a tool that I really depended on and to realize that uh, you know a significant um, piece of the narrative was totally missing it it really kind of sent me on a a crazy spiral, which I think is is what you are addressing with your BIPOC design history courses. Um, but before we get there, um, I just wanted to ask you if you could if you could set some context for um, for non designers who are watching this, and if you could tell us what is the power of graphic design and visual communication. Mm, that's a really great question. I think. What is sometimes um, hard to do about setting the context of graphic design is because it's literally in everything, yeah. in the built environments, all over our world, particularly now in COVID, where we spend a lot of time looking at a screen. 
everything that we encounter has been touched or influenced in some way by a graphic designer. Right. <laughs> and I think we're now a lot more savvy, like the general public is more savvy about design and knows about design. But for many years, it was kind of this invisible art. And I guess if you're doing your job correctly as a graphic designer, like no one notices it. Yeah, <laughs> they just exactly. get the feeling yeah. like, oh, this this letter has this kind of form or this like, oh, like this experience of, I don't know, a website is usable or like a book makes sense or it feels right or um, that ad like, oh, I wanna buy that thing. Like it, may, it moves me to take an action. Yeah. Um, so I think design has a lot of power and it's very much tied to economics, right? It's tied to capitalism and this idea of desire, um, com emotion. consumer desire, emotion, yeah. right? Sensory experience. I think maybe a little bit more than like some of the other design disciplines like architecture. I mean, architecture does too and product design too, but like there's something about graphic design, I think particularly in terms of commerce mm. that's very much tied to that. And so that's why I think sometimes it's hard to sort of like notice it if you're not tuned into it because it's it's got that power to be sort of transparent or to be like um ipso facto or like feel like it's like meant to be the way that it's meant to be and that's totally designed on purpose yeah yeah what a great answer thanks so much um all right so now we get into the beef of the conversation yes yes how do we decolonize graphic design knowing all that what you just explained about graphic design. How do we, how do we go about doing that? I, I love that you brought up Megs and asked me about that because I was thinking about um, one of the co-authors for this course on BIPOC design history, Pierre Bowens. Um, in his research and in his lectures, he shows a series of diagrams that were made by Brandon Waybright who's also a contemporary design historian, where he counts the number of people of color, women designers oh. um, in Megs. And it's like, it's like atrocious, you know, it's like three yeah. black designers, right? Yeah. Um, so I think part of, part of doing the decolonizing is doing what you were saying, Nina, and like looking at what's there now or what has historically been there in terms of design history and then radically expanding that, you know? And I feel really, lucky to do the research I did about Du Bois um, and his diagrams that um, were recently digitized, I think in 2016, 2017, and was able to write a book about these amazing graphics that, um, you know, made in 1900 by a bunch of people of color, mm -hmm. displayed at this World's Fair, you know, that millions of people saw these graphics. Um, and then it kind of basically disappeared and sort of was erased both by white supremacy, um, but also um, reached black audiences in a way and, um, but just didn't, wasn't part of this sort of like significant quote unquote canon of design right. history or art and design history. And I think par part of what the class we're working on, the kind of work that I've been interested in is just starting to, um, you know, sh show <laughs> designers, show people there's so much more right. that I think hasn't been as widely recognized or talked about. It's been there and it's been in conversations maybe with people of color, or maybe um, there's a long history of decolonization in the global South, like Central South America of scholars in other fields, literature, art that have been doing that. I think it's just design. We're a little bit slow on the uptake <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because of that. And probably because of the commercial factor too. Like it's, it's not something that we've been digging into as deeply as the, I think the way we are, even though there have been many design historians, people like Martha Scottford, yeah. um, you know, who have been, talking about the lack of women representation, lack of other kinds of representations, but we're just, we're at this tipping point where everyone's ready to do the work now. Yeah. I, I recently watched um, a presentation you, you gave online and um, it was about the, about Du Bois's um, uh, 
oh, geez, gosh, I'm totally blanking on the, the plates um, that that was presented at the World's Fair. And and at the start of the presentation, you talked about um, about Megs and other designers and, and critics of the day. And um, it just got me thinking about what it is just to have that title of designer. And is mm -hmm. it that Du Bois didn't have that? And that's part of the reason why um, his body of design work has just been, you know, kind of left out of graphic design history. Um, and I, I was thinking about that because my personal background, I went to, to art school to study design, um, but I'm very fortunate to work with colleagues who came to graphic design from all sorts of different career paths, you know? And so there's this great diversity um, of, of experiences and some are very formal like mine and some are very much self-taught and, and, you know, they just needed to be a graphic designer. So they became a graphic designer. Um, so, I, you know, I just, I think that there's sort of like this club, you know, of, mm. of the cool kids, you know, and then there's this group of people like Du Bois who maybe don't get included in that club because, they don't have the pedigree or whatever, even though he was a very educated man, you know? So I don't know, that's something that I've been, that I've been chewing on lately, thanks to a lot of the um, content that you have online right now. That is um, such a great question. I, I really love the way that you're framing that about like who gets to have that title. Yeah. And I feel like you, what you were saying about the club is spot on too. Like, I feel like I, Feel pretty privileged too to have the schooling that I did like to be kind of considered part of the club yeah and I think I think you're right and I've also had a good fortune to teach students who come from other disciplines and I find them amazing designers like I yeah. think you know that's, like the kind of right that's the thing is it's like oh man you didn't get a formal design education but you're such a good designer like yes you yes it's yeah crazy and I, to me. And I think that that's, you're right, there's been both in terms of who who's given that title and who's allowed to practice, mm -hmm. and then like who who are referenced in the history. Like they're, right. those are related sets of gatekeeping and yeah. exclusion that have happened. And it unfortunately lines up with a lot of the ways that America has, you know, had its levels of exclusion from right. white supremacy to misogyny to you know all the bell hooks things you know right. uh, patriarchy uh, capitalism <laughs> white supremacy misogyny homophobia <laughs> you know so um, I, I and I think maybe a little bit of a kind of um, insularness that graphic design mm. not sort of being willing to sort of like oh yeah here's a bunch of sociologists, they yeah. do field research, they deal with like numbers and text and form and it's communicated in graphic print and an exhibition design. <laughs> so I was like, how is that not graphic design? You know? and, <laughs> yeah. and, and made 19 years before the coining of the term exactly. graphic design happened. Yeah. And like, when you look at those plates, I mean, he's establishing uh, design techniques and, and, you know, I, I don't know, it's just, it's very inspiring to look at. And, and I think hopefully also enraging as well, just if yeah. you understand the context of it all. Um, I guess that sort of, uh, kind of brings me into the, the next question that I have for you, um, which is if, if, we sort of just talked about it, but if we could elaborate a little bit more about how how graphic design is used as a means of oppression, both historically and still currently, um, and I, I would just love to get your take on that and and kind of thinking about um, you know all the the protest posters and protest art and protest vandalism that we've seen lately too. I think that's amazing. I uh, amazing question and it is enraging <laughs> to kind of feel like that design is still an oppressive force and 
um, to kind of bridge your question, I would say like, if you're not mad, you're not paying attention. Yeah. Um, you know, and if you're not upset, then you're not, you're not decolonizing your curriculum, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, or, or even kind of like the, you know, for practitioners too, I think this is really important. Um, yeah. work as well. And I think, you know, what happened last summer with George Floyd and this resurgence, reinforcement, re-echoing of Black Lives Matter and how, because of that happening at the same time as COVID-19, I have a colleague uh, at the National African uh, American uh, Museum of History and Culture, um, Rhea Coombs, who has been chillingly calling it COVID-1619, you know, so you had this kind of like, yeah, right, combination <laughs> of social justice and this pandemic, which I think because of that and the economic conditions of that, we really got a big wake up call mm -hmm. where we realized because we're having this global reset and shutdown of things as we expected that we really can um, reconsider like everything that we're doing. And I think part of how that um, how that kind of breakdown of life as we know it made us aware of how much design, like design of social networks, design of logos, all of it um, mm -hmm. reinforces notions of white supremacy, reinforces yeah. notions of class problems and distinctions. We saw it in also the, um, the infection rates of people yeah. with COVID-19 and how predominantly that affected people of color, communities of color, because of historic redlining, um, gerrymandering, other kinds of physical, spatial designed oppression. And Amari Sousa, who does a talk about design thinking and um, streamlining and like connects it to eugenics, <laughs> mm. um, which is, it's super chilling. It's really hard to look at, but you then see this origin and design thinking comes out of that study of human factors. And a lot of the people like Norman Bel Geddes, he talks a lot of, about him who are part of this like uh, utopia of the automobile industry and highways and how that has historically designed literally barriers right literally put I, oppression into the like the design physical and graphic and yeah. urban fabric of our country like and the so city of atlanta you, yeah, is an example of that right okay yeah like atlanta i've not, I've for not sure. visited the no South, so. i haven't been to it i've been through atlanta a little bit um but like i lived in miami uh new york so like miami 95 and the way that it was went through overtown it destroyed this right. um you know mecca of jazz and black uh entertainers the bqe with robert moses in new york um, yeah. you can just yeah. see all these different in los angeles chicago right. where so i feel like um the class has made me even more aware <laughs> like all these amazing scholars have like added to kind of my own research. And so I think that by seeing the clear picture of it, now we can start to sort of say, what are alternatives? Like what are different ways that we can teach design and mm -hmm. um, talk about it? And I think because of COVID and these current conditions, like I don't think we would have been able to put this class together the way, because there's people from all over the country and then the participants too are like all over the world. So um, it makes this very cool critical mass of people who want to make changes, both students, faculty members, professional designers, all in this kind of amazing container where we're really unpacking and questioning design as we've known it, or at least graphic design yeah, and, and how, how we might go about teaching that and how we might go about practicing that. How did you, I mean, how is that going, putting these classes together? I know you're, you're at the tail end of your curriculum right now, but I know you are a professor at Otis, so I'm assuming you 
you know, had that background to to fall back on 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 how to bring um, these courses online. But what was the process like, and and how did how were you able to get all these people from around the world together? Is it your global network of design friends? <laughs> yeah, I think it's a combination of that. Of like, I, I mean, I think the Du Bois thing. Um, mm -hmm. gave me a lot of visibility and access and right. to speak about because it felt very revolutionary and the timing it is to rediscover him and position yeah. into the canon. And so I, through that process, I was able to meet a lot of other amazing scholars who are doing this work. One other space that I think is important is this um, couple other spaces. Um, Vermont College of Fine Arts, where I also mm -hmm. advise students and um, help build a program. There were three Black faculty that happened to be teaching together like for a few years, which is pretty unusual in a design program. So Zidi Masangi um, and Tashika Arsenio Sutton. Um, and Tashika and I, and then one of our students, Pierre, who also happens to be uh, black design educator who started doing research and work with the three of us, ZD, mm -hmm. Sheikh, and myself, and then has contributed this class. And now it's going to be a book. So this kind of critical mass of like connectedness helped. And then um, I think people are just really hungry for this yeah. kind of information and just the timing of it and the fact that it was something you could do either rapidly <laughs> accelerated over the month or also asynchronously. So people are still coming back and watching and participating. And you can actually, um, there's a Discord channel space where you can, people can continue to dialogue after the fact. And so I think it was just all these kinds of forces that came together. Um, and part of what I think also makes it exciting is um, the framework of trying to have a kind of more anti-capitalist way of setting up the course and like we're sharing the proceeds with the lecturers in a different way right. than you would if you had contributors. And we're, um, we're also going to be donating to Black educational initiatives in design and otherwise. So I think this idea of new models um, are, I think that's part of why it was so successful um, and why there was so much excitement. And I had been on social media kind of like teasing the idea, like and asking people like, do you, would you want a you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. BIPOC centered design history? And there was a, people were like, yes, yes. And like, this is what we want. Um, and so we feel like this has been like one pilot in that, but there's so many other stories. This has been focusing on Black design in African diaspora, but there's like indigenous right. histories of design and Latinx experiences. You know, I think there's the whole, we've had like one talk focus on queer Black experiences, but I feel like that could be a whole nother <laughs> sequence of courses. And so I think um, the process has also the classes themselves have the students in there in the chat, like there's really a range of learners. So the chat and the resources, like it's not just the lecture and like us who are organized in the class. I feel like there's so much learning coming from people participating in the class. And I feel like that is the, the most interesting part of it. And we're sharing some of the resources um, for that, for people who have like signed up on for classes. And we're also, trying to share them freely on like platforms like arena and yeah. like other social medias as a kind of way of like, we want this knowledge to get out in the world. So right. Yeah. Like how do we like make it available and make it sustainable for us, but not gatekeep um, that information the way that it has been before. Well, I suppose my, my last question then uh, would be for folks who are interested about this class, where should they go? It's an awesome question. So the <laughs> <laughs> BIPOC design history, um, dot com is where the class is hosted and people can still sign up. You can sign up for individual a la carte 
lectures, like if there's just one class, you know, say about Du Bois and black data that you want to take, um, or um, emancipation and its connection to design history. I had mentioned that like black queer stories in print. Um, so you can kind of pick and choose like a few of them. And then there's also like a class pass <laughs> where you can kind of get access to all the classes. Um, and there's also a sliding scale um, for students, uh, educators, and also for BIPOC, professional designers, BIPOC students and educators. And there's also scholarships too. Yeah, so if you're, yeah. if you're in need or you wanna take the course and you can't, you can receive a scholarship, which is pretty amazing. Um, so that's kind of the best place. And then I know a few schools and design studios are also now doing like um, group licenses or institutional licenses. So um, a, a number of people are encountering it that way, like in their class. That's um, so amazing. Yeah. What an incredible resource to have in a classroom. Yeah, I think it's it's really, and the discussions are, are part of it too. So you get to see the talk, but then you can see the, the real time um, Q&A. And then, like I had mentioned um, on Discord, you know, you can join and be part of the conversation. One other thing, one of our talks is totally free. So you can watch, uh, there's a talk that Colette Gator gave around civil rights graphics called Strike Through. And it's amazing. And that's, anyone can download that. You don't need to buy a pass or anything. Yeah, I actually did uh, download that one, not because it was free, but because I happened to be interested in the, um, in the content. And I think, um, yeah, besides it being a, a, you know, a great lecture and a just a really informative hour and a half, um, I think it's worth visiting BIPOCdesignhistory.com just to see a really beautifully designed website. And congrats on that part. <laughs> it just yeah. seems um, from top to bottom a really um, thoughtful design process that, that you and your team have rolled out here. Yeah, I think that's one of the advantages of being someone who's interested in history and scholarship and having the formal skills of being a graphic designer is you can also make it a good experience to totally. view. And um, just like, cause it's kind of nerdy and note about the type, the typeface um, is a is modern- Is it inspired by Yeah, Dubois inspired by du Dubois? Du du yeah, inspired by Dubois. So Trey Seals, a vocal type, who is an amazing young type designer who has been doing revivals of typography tied to movements of protest or liberation. Oh, awesome. um, women's suffrage, civil rights, uh, queer liberation. But this typeface is based off Du Bois's lettering and it's called William. So it's um, very much, it feels really cool to sort of have a graphic container and graphic language that does justice such as sort of like the origin point, at least for me, yeah. the team around doing this kind of history. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Silas. I really enjoyed our conversation. Me too. Thank you, Nina. That was really fun. Yeah. Hope we get to do it again sooner rather than later. Totally. <laughs> totally. I would love that. Thank you to Nina and Silas for such a beautiful conversation. And a reminder, if you'd like to learn more about Silas's research, you can head to BIPOCdesignhistory.com. Up next, we'll hear from Deb Raji. Deb is currently a fellow with Mozilla, where she aims to reimagine algorithmic auditing and evaluation practice in order to hold those that deploy artificial intelligence systems accountable. As the first intern of the Algorithmic Justice League, a nonprofit that raises public awareness around the social implications of AI, she emerged as one of its star researchers. She was previously a research fellow at the Partnership on AI and a tech fellow at the AI Now Institute at New York University. Deb was recently named an innovator under 35 by the MIT Review. In her talk, she'll touch upon one of her major research projects with the Algorithmic Justice League, where she worked on an audit on Amazon Recognition's deployed facial recognition product, 
discovering it was significantly less accurate for darker skinned women than for white men. In addition to sharing that research, she'll be sharing her work to advocate to improve and de-bias these technologies, as well as trace some of the real stories of people who experienced misidentification through deployed facial recognition technologies. Here's Deb. Thanks so much for that introduction. Hi, uh, I'm Deb Raji, otherwise known as Inilua Deb Raji. Uh, and I'm here to talk about the struggle for algorithmic injustice. And this is work I'm doing as a Mozilla Fellow and also a Fellow at the Algorithmic Justice League. So first, I'd like you to meet Robert Williams. Robert Williams, you know, is a regular man with a loving wife and a beautiful daughter. And unfortunately, um, he was falsely arrested for a crime he did not commit due to a false facial recognition match. This means that police officers were able to target Mr. Williams and escalate the biometric evidence to the point of arresting him for a crime he did not commit. Um, when you think about the situation and what happened to him, it's incredibly unjust. But what I wanna do in this presentation is really trace the story of Robert Williams and understand the different lessons we can learn from his story and others, as well as how challenging it is to actually accumulate evidence to demonstrate and discuss this injustice. So first I'm gonna start by just explaining what facial recognition is and how widespread it is. I think a lot of people don't realize how prevalent a technology it is. If you're going to the airport, uh, you probably encountered a facial recognition system to match your face to the passport. Uh, if you are an American citizen just walking around, you're probably surveilled through um, police use of uh, facial recognition. Uh, if you go to a school in New York, uh, there's facial recognition in those schools and uh, even going into a Rite Aid, uh, where it was discovered in about 200 stores across the U.S., they deployed facial recognition systems. And we know that there's a challenge or there's a potential, uh, there are potential justice issues with facial recognition because people are suing. So there's been a set of um, class action lawsuits in Illinois and other states um, around biometric access and trying to understand um, how to protect uh, our personal information, uh, our face data from different firms trying to access it for the use of the development or use of facial recognition. Uh, we have some tenants uh, suing their landlord, uh, Uber, who makes use of facial recognition in order to confirm the identities of their driver for their internal app, um, faced two lawsuits, one from a black driver and a trans driver about how this technology did not work for them. And then a student suing Apple due to a false facial recognition arrest. Um, and this really just highlights all of these issues, highlights one of the big uh, you know, misconceptions and uh, around the way that machine learning models work in the real world versus how it works in sort of a sci-fi narrative. So you know, to the left, you have Sophia the robot, which is this very famous robot, very humanoid, looks very complex. Um, and there's only maybe one at most three Sophias across the entire world. Um, not a lot of uh, robots that are that convincing and that um, aesthetically pleasing. And you know, on the other side, you have the Roomba and the Roomba looks super simple. It is very simple, not very complicated, um, but this is deployed in millions of um, households across the US. So the simplicity of the Roomba doesn't actually um, compromise its ability to impact many, many people, millions of Americans. So the most impactful uh, technology here is not necessarily a Sophia, uh, but the Roomba. And the real world is full of Roomba models, models that are very simple or seem very straightforward in terms of their technical functionality and how they're constructed, um, but incredibly prevalent and incredibly widespread. So algorithmic auditing is this idea of looking at these systems that are deployed and trying to hold them accountable. Um, unfortunately, there's things that get in the way of us being able to understand how these systems permeate our lives and actually hold them accountable when they fail us in ways that cause injustice. So the first thing we learned doing this work is that if it doesn't work for everyone, it doesn't actually work at all. Gender Shades was a study that we did um, where it was an external multi-target black box audit of uh, commercial 
models, uh, facial recognition models in this particular case, trying to identify whether an image was male presenting or female presenting. And what I mean by what I mean by multi-target and black box and external just means that as auditors, we had no insider information to how the model worked at all. We were completely looking at these models from the outside. And, you know, we understood that there was potentially something to learn about these models because every other data set used in the field of facial recognition, we understood were skewed towards males. So usually you would have more male representation in a data set and also skewed towards lighter subjects. So more um, lighter skin individuals were in that data set. So the data set that we had to create, which is the PPB uh, benchmark, the pilot parliaments benchmark, that's the highlighted uh, row, um, was much more balanced with respect to male female representation and darker and lighter skin representation compared to all the other dominant benchmarks at the time. And when you look at PPB, you can see that it's quite balanced with respect to male female representation and darker and lighter skin representation. And this was done intentionally in order to represent different communities that we were worried about. And we were worried these systems did not function for and that we wanted to test and evaluate for. So what we did was, you know, an intersectional gender and skin type evaluation for gender classification. So we looked at the performance of these, of different models on these different subgroups of darker male, darker female, lighter male, and lighter female. What we found, uh, we did two audits, one in 2017, which we published, and then another published audit in 2018. And what we found was in the 2017 results, there was a huge discrepancy between the performance of these models on the darker female subgroup and the lighter male subgroup. So here you can see that the performance on the darker female subgroup is around 80%, and the performance on the lighter male subgroup is around 100%. So that's about a 20% performance difference. Compare that to the next year after they've already been publicly called out in an audit, um, you know, the company redeployed the model and updated the version of the of the of their uh, application program interface and were able to minimize the disparities between the lowest performing subgroup, which was still the darker female subgroup and the lighter male subgroup. And now you can see that the gap between the performance of the two is around is less than 2% versus 20% uh, a year ago. We saw this again happen with Face++, which was a Chinese uh, facial recognition company, where the performance on the darker female subgroup goes from about 65% to 95% to over 95%, um, while the performance on the lighter male subgroup only improves by about 0.3%. We see a similar thing with IBM. And uh, finally, we audited in 2018 companies that we had never audited before, companies that we knew were probably aware of the initial audits, uh, but we were curious if as an industry, the, the field had actually evolved and moved forward. And what we found was that other actors, other companies in the industry um, outside of the targeted companies um, did not actually make much of an improvement in the gap between the performance in the lighter male uh, subgroup and the darker female subgroup was still, still, still quite substantial. So, you know, what does this say about um, this, about a year or so, I would say that a year after we did our initial, our, our second or follow-up audit, um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is really the, 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 the group that does most of the auditing, the formal official auditing work on behalf of the government for facial recognition tools, commercial facial recognition tools, um, they were able to sort of validate our results. So they audited for a different task of face verification and face identification. And they found that these products were, you know, African, that Asian and African American people were up to a hundred times more likely to be misidentified than white men using these tools. So it indicated to us that there's a huge disp performance disparity that still persists between um, darker skinned individuals, specifically darker skinned female individuals and um, lighter skinned male individuals. And um, another interesting sort of development that came up after our audit was this idea of a pilot audit, uh, which kind of gained popularity where people would take their facial recognition system and they would ask the question of, well, you know, how does this actually work 
on the ground. If we were to deploy it or pseudo deploy this system, you know, how many um, instances would we have uh, sort of achieved our objective? And what was discovered was, you know, a pilot that happened in the UK had an 81% error rate, meaning it was incorrect 81% of the time. And another pilot um, in New York uh, on the MTA system actually failed 100% of the time and was not able to get a single face correct. So it's clear that once you actually deploy these systems in their real world conditions, uh, the technology is lacking and is not functional for everyone and thus not functional at all. So the second lesson we learned, um, you know, just thinking about algorithmic auditing and uh, trying to hold these systems accountable is that, is that ignorance is bliss, but irresponsible. You know, before our audit work and particularly before our follow-up work in 2018 and 2019, we would always and constantly, constantly get responses like this. And the, here's a direct quote from Torsen Thies, who's um, the director of algorithmic development at Cognitech. Cognitech is um, Cognitech and NEC are both incredibly, you know, influential players in the facial recognition industry. Um, and he said, uh, it is harder to take a good picture of a person with dark skin than it is uh, for a white person. Um, and here he's implying that, uh, you know, darker skin individuals are just a fundamentally harder technological problem. And as a result of that, this is why the technology does not work for them as well as it does for lighter skin individuals. However, we can see from our audit results that after a year, uh, a year after we audited the initial companies, so you know IBM, Face Plus Plus, and Microsoft, uh, those companies were all able to minimize the performance disparities between the darker female subgroup and the lighter male subgroup. In the case of Microsoft, they went from about a twenty percent disparity to less than two percent, um, and um, you know Face Plus Plus went from over a thirty-five percent disparity uh, to less than a five percent disparity. So we can see that the companies are capable of making better decisions, and they just did not. Also, all the companies that we audited uh, in 2017 were able to redeploy their system within seven months in time for the audit in 2018. So this has clearly been debunked as a very kind of ignorant response. Um, and that's something that we learned through the process that um, there is accountability to be had when, you're perform when your systems perform differently on different groups. Uh, the other sort of uh, project I was involved in at the time was really trying to reflect on how do we remind engineers building these systems about their responsibility as they develop these tools, as they develop these models. So how do we remind them of their responsibility to build things that work for everyone? So here is one idea, which is this idea of a model card. And a model card is really a way of reinforcing to those constructing and building these systems. So engineers or even product managers or other internal stakeholders within a company and point them to different questions and prompts of what they need to answer about the model before they can reasonably deploy it. So here's an example of a model card for Google's perspective API product, which um, supports the filtering of comments from public forums. And you'll see here that um, in the initial sort of version of uh, Perspective API's product, um, it would disproportionately flag specific words such as black gay or um, black homosexual as uh, toxic and filter those words out of public forums. And in a later version, you can see that they addressed a lot of the issues and the disparity between the performance of these systems on you know, identity terms like black or gay um, are not necessarily um, flagged as toxic in the same way that any other identity term would be flagged. So even to demonstrate progress or to evaluate and assess um, the situation for a particular product, um, we found that the model card setup was a really good way of reminding engineers about their responsibility to make these systems work for everyone. Um, the model cards effort exploded into a more, um, a robust framework that we call the Smacter framework, which was pretty much an attempt at an end-to-end -end audit framework um, throughout the entire product development cycle for uh, an AI or machine learning product. Um, that means from the moment of conceiving the product and the idea all the way until reflecting on, um, you know, uh, a, a post-deployment plan or um, a design mitigation, uh, we would have all these different 
document uh, doc and documentation templates, you know, borrowed from adjacent disciplines that where internal audits um, are very common. Uh, and we try to sort of see if we could articulate different ideas of how to capture some of the decisions that these engineers were making and get them to be a little bit more reflective about their responsibility uh, to uphold um, just systems. Uh, a, a sort of final note on this idea of documentation and engineering responsibility. Um, I also worked with a group at called the Partnership on AI, um, where Google is a member of the Partnership on AI. Um, and uh, this is a amalgamation of different companies. So Google, Amazon, Apple, and other companies um, where all of these companies actually sat down and recognized the importance of documentation and engineering responsibility. And they collaborated on this idea called the About ML project, where these different companies would sort of put forward their different proposals for documentation and discuss the pros and cons of these different plans and things that could happen together and strategies on how to move forward together. Um, you know, unfortunately, though, not every corporate response was perfect. There was a lot of challenges um, with the corporate responses around diversifying data. So as we pointed out that these models, these facial recognition models did not work as well for darker skin individuals. Uh, we had a situation where, you know, uh, Chinese companies were then trying, attempting to, uh, you know, collect or uh, purchase data of um, uh, faces uh, from different African countries, in this case, Zimbabwe, um, in an attempt to diversify their data set. And there's also the situation with IBM where um, IBM, uh, in an attempt to build a more diverse data set, um, uh, just grabbed images from Flickr without really properly informing the individuals whose images they grabbed or getting their consent in any way. So there's a lot to look out for in terms of how the companies actually respond to um, the realization that their um, that their algorithms are discriminatory. The other thing as well is um, you know how they uh, guide or restrict the use of this technology. So uh, at the time that we had audited Amazon, the ACLU was actually investigating Amazon for its sale its sale of facial recognition uh, to ICE, which is an uh, immigration enforcement agency, and uh, different law departments, different law enforcement uh, departments. And um, you know, so there was a lot of public pressure. There's a huge there's a huge sort of amount of public scrutiny on the fact that Amazon's product was not very functional for darker skinned individuals, and particularly darker skinned females. Um, However, Amazon's excuse at the time, and here's a direct quote from Matt Woods, he says, you know, we clearly recommend that facial recognition results should only be used, you know, when the results are at least 99%, and even then only as one artifact in, of many in a human-driven decision. Um, but we can see, uh, you know, through subsequent work by Georgetown Law um, called Garbage In, Garbage Out, where they demonstrate that police departments um, almost never use these uh, technologies appropriately. They often put in you know, sketches or images of celebrities to get leads using this facial recognition technology. Um, but also more importantly, there was an investigation by Gizmodo where they actually discussed and went directly to one of Amazon's uh, known police clients. And that client um, uh, asked a question of what, what's a threshold? They had no clue what Matt Woods was referring to. Um, and thus, you know, we're likely just using the default threshold of 80%. So, you know, the lack of restrictions or guidance for those making use of that technology can be just as dangerous as flaws in the technology itself. Um, and then finally, you know, those making use of the technology can definitely misuse, abuse, and weaponize that tool. Um, like I mentioned, Amazon in particular, when we audited them, uh, was under investigation for how they were making, how they were pitching that technology for use, uh, you know, to oppress minorities under different circumstances, such as law enforcement and ICE. And as we can see with the case of Robert Williams, um, when you are in a minority group and you're misidentified, uh, the prejudice of that situation actually makes it more likely for that false match to escalate to arrest. So it makes that vulnerable group even more um, at risk. And um, like I mentioned, you know, the situation with the, the tenants, um, with a landlord trying to install facial recognition to monitor the tenants, you know, there's a lot of uh, scary situations where people can actually manipulate or weaponize the tool in order to harass a minority group. 
So lesson three, you know, we can resist technology that doesn't work for us. And this is one of the most important lessons we, we learned from this entire Sega. So, you know, um, a lot of these bills, uh, you know, citing our, our work, which was very exciting, but uh, these, th there's a bunch of bills throughout the entire country um, uh, calling for the ban or the pause on the use of facial recognition um, due to its last lack of functionality, due to the privacy risk and the surveillance risk. Um, and we can see that a lot of these bills, some of them are very local, um, uh, you know, from the Bay Area to Berkeley, San Francisco, um, and uh, enough local participation actually prompts uh, a statewide discussion. So that's happening in California and Massachusetts um, and Portland, um, Oregon, um, and and uh, and and at that after that level, um, hopefully there's some level of uh, national discussion. And we do see that with facial recognition. There's a Privacy Act bill um, that's in place and some discussion around an audit bill um, to come. But most importantly, um, the public pressure around the discussion of this topic actually caused, you know, public resistance to the use of the sale of facial recognition by these companies. So after we had initially audited these companies, um, the company's sort of PR response was, oh, of course, we support legislation, we support regulation in theory, um, but we're going to continue selling these products. Um, and, um, you know, this was really a lot of the public pressure really dialed up um, following the George Floyd protests where people began to, again, sort of question the best interests of the police use of facial recognition um, for surveillance purposes. And in that moment, it became clear that these companies had to take an action to step away from the tool um, because it was that dangerous and put so m that many lives at risk. So um, you can see here that like, you know, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, and IBM all backed away from the use of uh, the sale uh, and the dissemination of facial recognition tools. Um, but I'll mention sort of this downside of that, which was it, it was a two-year fight. So it was a very long journey to get Amazon to go from this place of refusing to, you know, quit selling their technology um, uh, to finally pausing the use of, uh, pausing the, the, the police use of, of, uh, of its software. Um, so all of this to say that um, the pressure uh, to actually execute that change uh, took an incredibly long time, but um, we feel it was definitely worth it. So, you know, for every Robert Williams, there's so many other individuals, you know, the widespread use of this technology really necessitates very careful attention to bias and abuse. We have, uh, you know, AI driven dermatology tools that don't work on darker skin patients. We have, uh, all kinds of uh, algorithms in use during the criminal justice system, um, making all kinds of mistakes, actually sending people to jail or extending their sentence. Uh, we have, uh, you know, algorithms that uh, systematically discriminate against women, voice assistants that don't work on accents, um, an algorithm during the COVID era that had misassigned grades to lower income students. So there's a clear need for us to pay attention to these to this topic, to, to care about this, uh, not just for Robert Williams as an individual, but everyone that he represents. Thank you very much. <laughs>